October 1942, the battle for Guadalcanal reached its climax. U.S. and Japanese naval forces went head to head in a brutal showdown. They committed all their carriers to a decisive battle to decide the Guadalcanal campaign. What ensued was a savage battle for dominance of the South Pacific. On land, sea, and air, opposing forces clashed in a vicious fight for survival. A conflict of unprecedented scale and ferocity, where the outcome was anything but certain. On August 8, 1942, U.S. forces landed on Japanese-held islands in the Solomon Islands chain. This move was intended to prevent the Japanese from using these islands to threaten supply routes between the United States and Australia. The landings by the 1st Marine Division marked the beginning of the six-month-long Guadalcanal campaign. Because of the high concentration of Japanese submarines in the region, the area between U.S. supply bases in New Caledonia and Guadalcanal became known as Torpedo Junction. The Saratoga and Wasp were torpedoed by these submarines. Although the Saratoga survived, she would not return to action until January 1943, leaving only the Hornet and Enterprise to fight in the upcoming battle. Despite this, the Allies maintained air superiority over Guadalcanal during the day, thanks to Henderson Field aircraft. The Japanese, on the other hand, were able to operate their ships around Guadalcanal at night, when aircraft were unable to operate effectively. A situation developed whereby the Allies delivered supplies and reinforcements to Guadalcanal during the day, and the Japanese did the same by sending fast warships at night. The Allies attempted to halt this almost nightly supply run dubbed the Tokyo Express, but failed, resulting in a stalemate. By mid-October, the Imperial Japanese Army believed it had gathered sufficient forces to seize Henderson Field and drive the U.S. Marines into the sea. The Japanese significantly underestimated the number of U.S. forces on Guadalcanal throughout the campaign. In fact, both sides had roughly equal troop numbers on the island. The Army requested Navy assistance for the upcoming ground offensive. Knowing that the U.S. Navy would have to respond to this threat to Henderson Field, Admiral Izoroku Yamamoto gave the offensive his full support, hoping to finally crush the U.S. carrier force in a decisive battle. The formidable Third Fleet, which included five carriers, set sail for the Solomon Islands in mid-October from the main Japanese naval base at Truk. Despite Yamamoto's growing frustration with Nagumo's failures, particularly at Midway, he retained tactical command of the fleet carriers. Nagumo's large force consisted of two fleet carriers, the Shokaku and Zuikaku, which had avoided the disastrous Midway battle due to being unavailable at the time, and two new medium carriers, the Hio and Junyo, which had two-thirds the capacity of the fleet carriers at 53 aircraft. The light carrier Zuiho accompanied the two fleet carriers in one task group, while Hayo and Junyo made up the second task group. Each carrier group had a vanguard task force of battleships, cruisers, and destroyers scouting ahead. The two U.S. carriers, Hornet and Enterprise, were deployed as two separate carrier groups about 10 miles apart under the overall command of Rear Admiral Thomas Kincaid. Japanese land forces on Guadalcanal launched a series of large-scale attacks against U.S. defenders beginning on October 20th. By the 25th, the Imperial Japanese Army had been decisively defeated with heavy casualties. In addition, the Hio suffered a fire in her engine room, which forced her to return to truck for repairs. Despite these setbacks, Japanese naval forces continued to maneuver off the Solomon Islands, hoping for an opportunity to destroy the U.S. Navy. By the early morning of October 26th, the adversaries were only 230 miles apart. Both sides launched search aircraft. The Japanese used dedicated reconnaissance aircraft, while the Americans used dauntless dive bombers armed with a light bomb. At quarter to seven, a U.S. scout plane spotted Nagumo's fleet carriers. Despite being at the edge of their strike range, Kincaid ordered an immediate attack from both of his carriers, a Japanese scout aircraft reported the location of the Hornets task force 12 minutes later. The Japanese were the first to launch their 64-plane strike force at 20 to 8. Kincaid did not get all 75 of his strike planes airborne until 20 past 8. A few minutes after launching her aircraft, 
The light carrier Zuiho was hit by a 500 pound bomb dropped by a dauntless scout aircraft that had managed to avoid the combat air patrol. The damage prevented the carrier's flight deck from landing aircraft, forcing Nagumo to retire the crippled carrier back to base. This meant that even before the opposing strike forces clashed, Nagumo had already lost two of the five carriers he had left Truck Harbor with just a few days before. Nagumo didn't know it at the time, but he had used up all his bad luck, and it was his opponent's turn to suffer. After a brief skirmish as the two opposing strike groups passed each other, the U.S. aircraft came upon the Vanguard Task Force some 50 miles ahead of Nagumo's carriers. Worried about their fuel level, all but one squadron attacked this force. The unfortunate lead ship of this task force was the heavy cruiser Chikuma, which received the vast majority of attention. She was hit by four bombs and suffered numerous damaging near misses. Battered and burning, she managed to limp back to base. Although Chikuma's crew did not appreciate it, they had done their side a great service by taking a beating. The 15 Dauntless bombers of the VS-8 squadron ignored the advance forces, battleships, and cruisers as they passed over them and found the Imperial Japanese Navy's main body. 12-0 swooped down on the formation, shooting down two, severely damaging two more, and forcing another to abort its attack, instead dropping its bomb near a destroyer. The remaining 10 dive bombers focused on the Shokaku, which was turning wildly below to avoid their attack. In one of the most precise strikes of the war, half of them hit their target. As an illustration of Shokaku's dire situation, during the Battle of Midway, Nagumo's carrier flagship was destroyed by a thousand pound bomb. The Shokaku had just been hit by five, wrecking her flight deck and causing serious damage to the ship's interior, but she survived. Unlike the Akagi, Shokaku had launched all her aircraft, stowed away her ordnance, and expunged her fuel lines. It would take six months to repair the extensive damage, however. It was nearly nine when the Japanese strike force commander sighted the Hornet task force and deployed his aircraft for attack. The Hornet had a strong fighter defense of 37 Wildcats, but they were ineffective because they were stationed at too low a height to intercept the bombers before they dropped their bombs. So most Japanese aircraft began their attacks relatively unmolested by U.S. fighters. In a coordinated attack, 20 torpedo bombers split up and approached from each side, while 16 dive bombers plummeted from above. The U.S. Navy was in the process of introducing powerful new anti-aircraft guns, with the 40-millimeter Bofors cannon replacing the unreliable 1.1-inch gun and the Orlikon 20-millimeter gun outperforming the 50-cal machine gun in stopping power. Heavy anti-aircraft fire from Hornet and her escorts had some success in shooting down and disrupting the assault. Three 250-kilogram bombs hit the Hornet in quick succession. While severely damaging, they posed no threat to her survival. The torpedo bomber hits, on the other hand, proved fatal. A torpedo hit the Hornet just below the bridge, creating a large hole. The bulkheads were able to withstand the impact, limiting the flooding to a small area. A second torpedo struck the engineering spaces, causing flooding and knocking out the engine rooms, which quickly cut the ship's power supply, leaving her dead in the water and listing to starboard. Warrant officer Satoa, in his burning dive bomber, decided to sell his life dearly by deliberately ramming the Hornet. As he plummeted towards the carrier, his wing caught the ship's smokestack, cartwheeling the flaming aircraft through the flight deck. Burning aviation fuel spread along the hangar and took two hours to extinguish due to the lack of power. Soon after, another damaged Japanese dive bomber approached and deliberately crashed into the carrier's side, sparking yet another fire. Altogether, Hornet had been struck by two torpedoes, three bombs, and two aircraft. She was powerless, burning profusely and listing to starboard, unable to land or launch aircraft, but Kincaid refused to give up on her. Three destroyers were ordered to come alongside and hose down the flames, while the heavy cruiser Northampton attempted to attach a tow line. As the first wave of Japanese strike aircraft returned to their carriers, one of them spotted the Enterprise in the distance and reported her location. The second wave of Japanese airstrikes appeared shortly after 10 o'clock. 
Seeing the dreadful condition of the Hornet, they continued some 20 miles further to attack Task Force 16. Over the next hour, 52 bombers and 12 Zeros attacked the ships of Enterprise's task force. They hit the Enterprise with three bombs, temporarily halting flight operations, and the battleship South Dakota and light cruiser San Joan with one each. Two destroyers were critically damaged, one sank, and the other barely survived. The only good news for the U.S. was that the damage control party on the Hornet had patched up the gaping holes in her side and got the fires under control, while USS Northampton had taken her under tow, pulling her along at five knots. However, it would not last. At one o'clock that afternoon, the two Japanese advanced support groups merged into one large surface fleet of four battleships, numerous cruisers, and destroyers. At top speed, they raced towards the last reported position of the U.S. fleet. Having recovered, rearmed, and refueled the remaining serviceable aircraft from the morning strike, Zuikaku and Junyo launched 39 aircraft shortly after 1 in the afternoon. They arrived in dribs and drabs over the Hornet over the next few hours. Seeing her under tow, they decided to finish her off. At 1523, one torpedo struck Hornet amidships, which proved to be the fatal blow. The hit not only ripped another hole in her hull, but the shockwave from the blast destroyed the temporary patching to her previous damage, undoing the previous hour's hard work and causing heavy flooding, which quickly resulted in a 14-degree list. With the powerful Japanese surface fleet closing in, Kincaid was out of time and options. Hornet had to be abandoned due to a lack of power to pump out the floodwater. Conceding defeat, the U.S. forces fled the scene of battle. To avoid the ship falling into enemy hands, two destroyers were tasked with ensuring that the Hornet went to the bottom of the Pacific. In a sad reflection of the state of U.S. torpedoes at the time, only four explosions were visible out of 16 torpedoes fired at close range on the stationary target. She refused to sink, so they pounded her with their five-inch guns until it became too dangerous to stay, with the Japanese surface fleet rapidly approaching over the horizon. Soon after the U.S. destroyers had left, two IJN fast destroyers approached the burning wreck with orders to salvage her as a war prize. However, it was quickly realized that she was beyond saving. She was put out of her misery by two lethal long lance torpedoes. As the battered Enterprise retired for repairs, the United States Navy had no operational fleet carriers in the Pacific for the first time since the war began. When viewed in isolation, the battle appeared to be a great victory for the Imperial Japanese Navy. They not only avoided losing any ships, but they also avenged the losses at Midway by leveling the score at four fleet carriers lost for each side so far in the war. With their decision to forego armor and self-sealing fuel tanks on their aircraft, they always lost more aircraft than the U.S. in carrier battles. So the 18 greater aircraft loss when compared to U.S. losses was not unusual. But at this point in the war, winning was not enough. The IJN required a crushing victory which did not occur. The first of 17 huge Essex-class carriers would enter service in less than six months, while the Japanese pilot training program could not keep up with the rate of losses. Because the Japanese Army was unable to capture Guadalcanal, the Navy was forced to relocate its carrier aircraft to land bases in the Solomons in a futile attempt to halt the Allied advance, further eroding pilot quality as losses mounted. Yamato's patience with Nagumo had finally run out and he was assigned to command an island outpost. The battle would reveal the folly of the Japanese Kentai Kesson strategy. This was just one in a long line of engagements that would take place in a drawn out war of attrition that the Japanese Empire could never hope to win. As Yamato had feared, the giant they had awakened 10 months ago was just starting to get into stride. If you like this presentation, there are many more similar high-quality videos on my channel page.